welcome to What Physicists Do. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure to introduce Dr. Esan Katami today of San Jose State University. Dr. Katami uh, has his bachelor's uh, degree in physics from, well, I didn't, we didn't run over this, Isfahan? Yes. Isfahan University in Iran. Uh, and his PhD is from the University of Cincinnati. So we were talking about his trek uh, to come to the United States and, and st start his graduate studies there. Dr. Katami studies exotic phases of matter um, through theoretical modeling and numerical simulation. He's going to, as mentioned in his um, abstract, discuss unexpected behavior of certain materials at low temperatures. His work has been published um, in preeminent um, journals Nature and Science, and he recently was awarded San Jose State's Early Career Investigator Award. Um, let's please welcome Dr. Katami. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Severson for inviting me. And um, it's, this is really a, a, an honor to be a part of this series. Um, uh, I had a great time uh, here so far with all the tours and everything. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, quantum simulations with, with coal atoms. Uh, that coal atom part is going to be uh, probably the second half of my talk. Um, I decided to go over uh, a lot of introductory um, uh, material and 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 uh, kind of ways that we we can uh, you know model uh, solids model electronic behavior of, of materials um, how we do it and and what we end up with that leads us to to cold atoms uh, to do some of the simulation for us so that's going to be the the first part of of the talk so, um, other than crazy and dance uh, <laughs> what is the other word that comes to your mind when you see this clip? Well, I think entanglement. Entanglement. Yeah, there's some symmetry going on. Not exactly the word I was looking for, but maybe we can... Pairs. Uh, pairs, yeah, definitely. There's some pairing going on between, between people in their dances, right? But it's not like they're not exactly doing the same thing, right? There's, there's some, some variation of you know, what each person does. Um, should I wait for maybe some more suggestions? Well, for I, I, I do not know where this is going, but right. when I looked at it, it reminded me, and, and we've been talking about how we have capstones, and we had uh, uh, a physics major who was a joint dance major, and, mm -hmm. he, and he did a thermodynamics. He, try to dance thermodynamics. So when I looked at this, now I do see the thermometer. You see the thermometer here, yeah, right. That's, that's I thought it was dancing thermodynamics, and I don't know why, but just their motions made me think of degrees of freedom. I just, that right. was just, and it may not be what you're looking for, but those are the right. things that popped into no, mind. No, it's very interesting that all the words that were mentioned are relevant to, to this dance that you saw. But the specific word that I was looking for, maybe you get a second. Cooper pair? Um, that's, yeah, very specific, but, but more generally, I was looking for, you have a third? No. Yes? Okay. I was looking for uh, correlation, right? So the qu question was, what would what physicists do? And when I thought about that question, all I could think of was that, you know, all I do in my research is, is to study correlations between different, different bodies, right? So here, uh, these are real bodies, these are real people. And you can kind of see that they, they dance, they, uh, they go around, they, they, they have, we have pairs. Um, but it's really the, 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 the correlation that, that is there, right? It's not exact mimicking of each other, but there is some correlation. If somebody is doing something, we can kind of say with a certain degree of confidence that there's someone else in front of them doing something similar in a, in a mirror fashion. So that's, that, that happens to be all I do in my research. And so what we need to study correlations is, uh, is a many-body system, right? If you have only one person, there is no correlation to be studied. So you need a many-body uh, system. The other important ingredient uh, for correlation is interactions between, between your body. So it's important for them to see each other, to follow each other's uh, you know, steps, and do kind of a similar thing. So interaction is also uh, an important ingredient. So when you think about uh, many body systems, uh, we can uh, 
go back to classical mechanics and think of the simplest uh, many-body system that we can think of. And in classical mechanics, uh, it would be a two-body two -body system. And that two-body system is you know, something like a binary star. So you have two masses that are interacting with each other through the gravitational force. So that interaction is there. And what they end up doing is that they do some kind of a circular motion, right? So they're gonna rotate around each other depending on their masses, the ratio of the masses. They're gonna rotate around their uh, you know, center of mass. So with two bodies, classically, this is a very simple, uh, simplistic uh, you know, uh, picture, right, that you get. But now let's add a third particle to our system and do a similar s simulation. So now you can see that I kind of started from, from these points, and these are probably three masses uh, that are very similar. And you can see uh, what, is, what is happening here is that with the addition of this third body, when I went from just two to three uh, body system, the dynamics changed uh, a lot, right? Now I have some rotation, but I can have also some ejection, I have some, some, some uh, you know, collision and, and, and whatnot. So just by increasing one, one more particle, it became a lot more complicated. So these are the type of uh, systems that, that I'm, uh, I'm dealing with. Well, I don't uh, do classical many body systems, I do quantum many body systems, and if we switch to quantum mechanics, you can again think of the simplest many body system that you can have in quantum mechanics, that would be the hydrogen atom, right? So it's some kind of a similar two-body situation. Uh, there's an attraction, this time it's a Coulomb attraction, and this is quantum mechanics, so you have to uh, essentially solve the Schrodinger equation, it becomes very complicated. You have to go to the spherical coordinate system, you end up doing separation of variables, and you find you know, orbitals, you find out that this electron cannot take any energy, cannot have any orbit, but uh, it can have uh, certain energy levels and be in certain orbits with certain symmetries. You end up with some quantum numbers and you can maybe even you know, uh, watch them. Uh, this, is, this is from a recent, relatively recent paper where uh, they essentially image a hydrogen atom. These are not exactly the, the um, uh, wave functions that you would get from this, this equation. It's like a combination of, of uh, wave functions with different wave numbers. Um, so even the two-body quantum system is, is very complicated to solve. This is probably one chapter of a quantum mechanics book, right? So the things that I'm interested in are, are solids where you have many, 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 many of these uh, atoms. And they are not even hydrogen atoms. They are much more complicated than hydrogen atoms. And they are close to each other in some you know, crystal structures. And I want to understand their properties. I want to understand the properties of, of the electrons that are involved in these systems. So what is very clear at this point is that if I want to uh, make any progress in, in understanding these systems, I have to uh, simplify. And I have to simplify uh, a lot. Uh, so that brings me to uh, you know, my, my spherical cow. Uh, I have to let go of all those little details about my atoms, about my electrons, and what is going on um, in diff different layers of my system, perhaps, uh, and come up with a very simple uh, model uh, to, to then uh, scrutinize uh, for, for understanding uh, some of these properties of these materials. So I, I want to come back later to what exactly I'm looking for, what kind of properties I, I'm, I'm talking about here. So as we move on, uh, that would be uh, become more and more clear. But now I want to go back to my, uh, to my perhaps hydrogen atoms, right? And I want to try to model uh, this solid. So here I have something uh, like a, a proton. Let's say this could even be a very complex atom with many, many electrons, with many uh, core electrons, and some loose valence electrons. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to ignore all those uh, electrons that are in, in the inner uh, orbits of this atom. And I'm going to just think of the very outer orbit where I have that electron that may be loose uh, on, on, on this atom um, and, and is moving around, right? So that 
uh, wave is kind of a symbolic uh, picture for the wave function of that electron uh, on this atom. So this is something that I would solve for a single, single atom and find out you know, what it is for a single electron to be on that atom. But for now, I've kept these two atoms uh, very much far apart from each other. So there's no talking, there's no interaction between these two atoms. So I have a system where I can have an electron on this atom with energy epsilon, and I can have maybe an electron on this atom, right, with energy epsilon. But what happens when we slowly bring these two atoms uh, close to each other? When we bring them so close so that the wave functions overlap, then this is no longer a single atom problem, right? If I want to know what an electron would do in the vicinity of, of these protons, I have to solve a two-atom problem. I have to solve these two together. And what you find is that there is going to be some quantum tunneling of the electron from one atom to the other atom. So if I leave an electron to be mostly on this outer orbit of this atom with energy epsilon, at a later time, I might have uh, my electron on the right atom. So there is this hopping process that shows up when you have overlap of, of the wave functions. So I'm going to associate this energy T uh, with this hopping process, and that's on top of the epsilon that, that was the energy of that, of that orbit. And so uh, mathematically, we can approach this problem using matrices in quantum mechanics. And you can kind of see that when these atoms were far apart, there was no T. And I had a diagonal matrix on the diagonal elements. I had the energies of each of these isolated atom orbits. Now that I have brought them close to each other, these uh, energies show up. In this matrix, uh, the first row corresponds to the first atom, perhaps to the left. And the second row or second column corresponds to the uh, atom on the right. And so when I have this hopping between them, that shows up as an off-diagonal term. And what I need to do is to diagonalize this matrix if I want to find the natural energies of this uh, two-atom system. And what I end up with is this picture. So initially, when they were far apart, I had a doubly degenerate energy level epsilon. Now I have uh, two, uh, two energy levels. So the idea is that now we can bring more and more of these atoms close to each other and create you know, these type of arrays, put them in, in, in some structure, which can then be a representative of what is going on in, in, a, in, a, in a, a crystal, in a solid. And so uh, if I want to summarize the type of approximations that I uh, made, um, we realize that we can uh, create essentially a lattice of this atoms, right? It can be any geometry, but the vertices on that lattice represent the atomic sites. Those are the red dots here. And the bonds between the red sites uh, represent that hopping energy T. So as I said earlier, I'm going to ignore all the uh, complicated structure of, of atoms, and I'm going to just assume that every atom has a single orbit, and my electron is going to live on that orbit. We know that electrons are fermions, and no two fermions can occupy the same quantum state. They cannot be in the same location, have the same spin, and everything else. So I can have one electron on that orbit, but I can also have a second electron if I choose the spin of that second electron to be opposite. So spin is another uh, quantum degree of freedom for quantum particles. Uh, and in this case, it can have only two directions. So it, it's either spin up or spin down. So after all, considering spin, I can have maximum two electrons at every atomic site. And I'm going to add something else to the mix, and that is when you have two electrons on the same orbit, they're going to be very close to each other. They're going to feel each other because they have, you know, the, uh, int the Coulomb interaction between them is a sim similar strength as the Coulomb interaction between an electron and a proton. It's just going to be repulsive. So in that case, when I have an uh, occupancy of two, when I have a spin up and a spin down on an orbit, I'm going to uh, consider a, a Coulomb interaction energy uh, for that scenario. And the other assumptions that we've already made 
is that this atomic structure is going to be uh, stable over very long distances. It's going to be a periodic structure, and it's going to be also stable over uh, long times. So it's not going to fall apart. And it's not moving at all. I'm going to assume that that, that crystal, uh, atomic uh, crystal is, is stationary for the most part. So we can put all of this together uh, and, and come up with our, our model. So this amounts to a, to a so-called quantum lattice model. In this case, it would be specifically a fermi hubbard model, which is something that uh, Hubbard came up with to uh, describe properties of transition metal oxides. And uh, in this Hamiltonian, this is uh, uh, probably the only, um, one of the only few technical slides that I have uh, in this talk. And those, for those of you who are familiar, these are some operators. So now I have to uh, uh, employ these operators to describe uh, the energy Hamiltonian of, of my system. And the C is a destruction operator. This C dagger is a so-called creation operator. And you can see this uh, site indices. This is at site J with spin sigma. The other one is at site I. And so if I have a spin up, let's say, at site J, when I operate this operator, I essentially kill, I destroy that, that electron at site J. But what happens next is that I operate this other operator, and I create the same spin up electron at a neighboring site I. So essentially, what this is simulating is this hopping, hopping process, right? And so I have this T here that, that represents that hopping energy associated to this, to this type of kinetic, kinetic part of, of the energy of my system. And I told you about this Coulomb interaction, so there is gonna be another term here um, that takes care of these type of situations and adds an energy scale U to, to my system uh, for, for these type of configurations. And that means um, here, as you can see, I have uh, two ends. These ends are uh, number operators, so they can be uh, zero or one. And the only time this term is non-zero is if each of them is, is one. So that means I have a doubly occupied site. I have a spin up and a spin down. And only in that case, I have to pay this energy penalty of U, which corresponds to the uh, repulsion of these two. So it's a very simple looking, looking problem. Um, and I essentially have to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, using you know, this, these operators. But despite its simplicity, uh, it's very rare to have any analytic solution for, for this model. Um, you have to have you know, very special situations, very sp special geometries to be able to say anything uh, analytically about, about this model. Even if you try to solve it numerically by coming up with those matrices, uh, you uh, quickly realize your limitations, and you realize that uh, if you go above one dimension, there is, there is nothing you can do uh, with, with numerics. You can get some, some insight, some information uh, down to some temperature, but you can't solve this model exactly uh, everywhere with all the parameters that you like. So I'm going to uh, tell you a little bit more about about um, what the limitations are uh, numerically uh, for this model. And so um, here I have a four by four lattice, so it's 16 sites, but let's not think of a, a, a big lattice site uh, like this. This is actually big for this model. Let's think of 10 sites and 10 particles. And I'm gonna choose the spin of my particles to be up or down. Uh, to be five up and five down. So I have equal number of ups and downs in my, in my system. In this case, it's, it's very different from having that single electron hopping around on the lattice. Now I have 10 electrons, and I have to come up with all possible configurations of them on this lattice if I want to be able to solve this, construct that matrix and solve this problem. Note that 10 is not the maximum number of particles I can have on this lattice, right? The maximum number of particles is actually, anybody? 
every time a, a number of electrons, so there's 20? Yes, yeah, spin up yeah spin exactly, down. exactly. So the maximum number is, is 20 because I could have two per, uh, per lattice site. So I have half of that. It's, it's actually called a, a, a half-filling uh, limit. And in that half-filling limit, um, the size of the matrices I have to construct is, is, is huge. So it's 63,000. So this may uh, sound very daunting, but you'll be surprised to know that I can you know, diagonalize these type of matrices on modern computers. I need 32 gigabytes of RAM to store it, and maybe another you know, 64 gigabytes for, for doing the calculation. It's going to take maybe a day or so, um, but you can do it, right? You can do it with, with a computer that has you know, um, a few hundred, a couple hundred uh, gigabytes of RAM. Dr. Katami, may I say, by the way, this is, I mean, this is complex stuff, but you've shown us graphically kind of simply, mm -hmm. and if I may sort of restate and point out things that are incorrect in this, but you're showing that, um, and you showed a diagram of like different materials, and I kind of, I kind of want to just for my own sense think about like, we're building all these materials. Mm -hmm. You're building a model to know what the electronic properties, maybe other properties as well, but clearly here we're talking about sort of the electronic properties That's correct. of novel materials. Mm -hmm. And so the basic physics, which can be quite complicated, you showed kind of simply in that one diagram, but then in a graphical model, you're saying, I can keep track of what's happening on all of these sites. I love seeing this because you're having 10 choose 5. Is that right? right this That's location? right, yeah. And we were just talking about that in our thermodynamics class. And you have to square it because you have two, two spin species. Can, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so this is this kind of beautiful way to allow you computationally to g engage in any particular problem if you kind of That's know right. what the conditions, the lattice, the spacings, the, the energy level, the E or the epsilon for right. the energy of that last mm -hmm. electron. Can you just, number one, is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, yeah. If you know all the possible configurations that your system can take, uh, you can construct a, a, an algorithm to, to calculate everything about that model exactly. And that's through matrices. That, that's through diagonalizing matrices. So you need to know all the configurations. For every configuration, you need to know all the energy dynamics in your system. You need to know if somebody can, can hop or if you have double occupancies. And you can account for all of them in your matrix and it ultimately diagonalize it and find your, your natural energies. And my follow-up is just that that's fantastic. I'm wondering. With that list of materials you had before, and maybe it's the later part of your talk, right. but if you could just tell for the for students who are wondering, like, what, what is this applying to? Right. What's a particular material and, and con condition where, boy, we really want to know how this behaves right. and use these models? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. So you see a two-dimensional square structure, and so this is actually uh, a build-up to study, you know, things like, if I may go back to that um, slide, so this is a picture of cuprates. So this is, a, uh, this is one type of high temperature superconductor, actually. So if you, uh, if you take this, this material and if you lower the temperature, at some point it loses uh, uh, the resistance to electric flow completely. Right? And people realize that uh, there are various types of these cuprate materials, and all of them share this uh, layer the like green and blue layers of copper and oxide, right? So if you then look closely on that, on that two-dimensional structure, you can see that your coppers are actually on a square lattice. And, 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 and if you know the chemistry, you know that these coppers are the ones that have this loose electron on them. And so what I'm trying to construct here it connects directly to these type of you know, materials and their low temperature properties. Um, and we see that with this very simplistic you know, point of view of, of this model, we can actually see stuff that look very similar to what people observe experimentally, uh, just doing experiments on, on, on low temperatures, uh, at low temperatures on, on this material. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of a uh, build up to, uh, you know, to do these type of, these type of uh, properties. And you know, of course, uh, you can approximate this uh, this is kind of a similar uh, situation. This is another type of high temperature superconductor. This is uh, iron, and these are the irons that, that contribute that valence electron. Uh, 
And if you look from above, uh, what their structure looks like, it's not a square lattice. It's some kind of a depleted square lattice. And you know, all sorts of other geometries and, and so on. So, uh, so in this case, the uh, electrons moving around and, and contributing to conduction is a very important uh, feature. And that's what I've built into my, to my model. I have these hoppings that, that if you know, the concentration of my, my particles is right, if the interaction strength is right, they can hop around and they can probably uh, do it very efficiently and, and become you know, conductors or, or superconductors, this, this simple model that I built. Sometimes you have situations where you don't have any movement of, of electrons, and I'm gonna show you some example, like some cartoon picture of that. Um, but it's the spin of the electrons. So, so electrons are completely frozen out in place, but it's their spin that is interacting with the neighbor's spin or, or with other spins. And so those are the um, quantum magnetic models that can describe you know, other materials like this one. This is mostly uh, uh, just electrons interacting through their spin. And, and when you lower the temperature for this material, you uh, can see some some very unusual magnetic uh, phases that, that show up uh, that you can detect for them. And so, so for this one and, and so on. So there's all sorts of uh, directions that you can go with this model and there's uh, different limits and diff different parameter regions that you can explore if you can solve it exactly to you know, touch base with you know, each of these, these materials and, and say something about their low temperature behavior. So if I double uh, the number of sites, then it, you know, the amount of RAM that I need is, is just uh, you know, impossible. Uh, so in those cases, we have to do uh, uh, so-called Monte Carlo sampling. We have, to, we have to say, we have to give up on the idea of, of having all the configurations accounted for, but just sample the important ones and from them come up with some, uh, some average uh, property for, for our model for a system. So uh, we have this model, so what do we do? What, what, what do we look for? Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, with physics scary, but I thought this would be an a interesting uh, video to look at. This is, um, she has a video series on, on YouTube, a YouTube channel uh, discussing. You know, but, but that's essentially what I, what I do uh, with this model. Now I have this model, I have many parameters to, to vary. Uh, and this is the same in nature. Uh, I can, with my material, I can put it under pressure, right? And, and cause some phase change, right? In, in, in that system, in that experimental system. I can change the concentration of electrons in a system. I can apply a magnetic field and see what happens as I increase the strength of the magnetic field, for example. Or I can lower the temperature and see what happens. So most of the interesting stuff happens when, when you lower the temperature. Um, and so I can do that uh, with this model that I built up, and I can uh, kind of sketch out what I should expect for, for this model to do at, at very low temperatures. So here is uh, the uh, picture of like a one-dimensional cartoon picture of, of these electrons just hopping around and doubly occupying and doing stuff on, on this lattice. If my temperature is high enough, if my temperature is larger than the energy scales in my, in my model, um, it doesn't really matter what, what they do. All these configurations have the same type of uh, contribution to whatever property I, I calculate. And that's because, uh, it, because there's so much heat in the system. It doesn't really, the cost of doubly occupying this U or hopping around is, is really small. So they kind of, they're kind of doing some random, random stuff at very hot temperatures. But what happens when I lower the temperature? So when I lower the temperature, uh, something happens and I enter the so-called MOT phase where I essentially freeze out this uh, electrons in place if I have uh, one electron per atom. And I, I lose that degree of freedom in my system, right? So if I look at the charge in my system, it's a perfectly uniform, uh, uniform charge. Right? Everywhere. There is no double occupancy because that costs a lot, a lot of energy if it's large. Um, so you can see the spins are kind of random. If I lower the temperature even further, what happens is that uh, you can come up with some effective model 
for, for this original model at very low temperatures. And what you realize is that the spins are going to tend to um, anti-align with each other on the neighboring sites. So it's a so-called anti-ferromagnetic phase that I should expect show up uh, in, this, in this model at very low temperatures. So this is a very symmetric case where I have one electron per site. What if I remove some of these electrons? If I remove them or if I add some electrons, I'm going to distort this perfect picture of one atom per site. I'm going to distort this magnetic order. And so maybe I can expect some uh, metallic, maybe I can expect some, some conducting properties to show up because now these particles can move around, right? So if I have some empty uh, sites in my, in my lattice, other electrons can hop around to this empty site and essentially conduct. And maybe if I remove enough of these, I can have situations where, where, uh, where the system is superconducting, right? So these are the type of things that, that can happen in this model. And this is just a cartoon picture. All the uh, antiferromagnetic bonds are shown by, by, by green. And this is a uh, you know, cartoon of this electrons hopping to the right, or uh, effectively, this empty site moving to the, to the left in the x direction. But something happens when, that, when, 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 the, when this uh, empty site moves, moves along. What happened was that it broke off all these uh, anti-alignments along the y-axis, right? And if I'm at very low temperatures where the system really prefers to be in this situation, it's not going to like, you know, this empty site moving much because every time it moves, it destroys these very strong bonds, right? So this single hole moving along is, is not really preferred by the system. But what happens if I bring that other empty site next to my empty site, right, and create a pair of these holes. Now they can move together. And the main difference is that you can see that these bonds along Y are not broken anymore, right? These anti-alignments remain the same. So this two moving together now as a pair doesn't really cost energy for my system, and the system can, can allow that. And it, this type of pairing is... Uh, the precursor to, to superconductivity. So if I have a system where it's perf like perfectly anti-aligned spins, then that could be uh, the you know, uh, initial point for, for getting superconductivity if I remove enough particles from my system. So I can hope that these, these things may, may happen. Of course, there's no uh, rigorous proof of that, and that's what we are looking for. Uh, a mechanism for, for uh, a microscopic mechanism for that to happen. But we can look at thermodynamic properties, for example. So we, when, whenever we talk about phase transitions, if you look at heat capacity of, of the phase transition of uh, water, you can see uh, sudden changes at the, at the temperature where phase transition happens. So I can look at the same thing for my model. I can look at the heat capacity of this Fermi Hubbard model. And these are the interaction strength. I've, I've chosen this kinetic energy strength to be, to be one. And you can see that there's generally two peaks in this, in this heat, cap heat capacity. And if you dig a little deeper, you realize that this peak is actually that mod phase. It's, it's where I froze out all the particles in place, right? And the charge was uniform. And this lower temperature peak corresponds to that magnetic ordering, corresponds to that anti-ferromagnetic ordering of my system. So there are very clear signals uh, as to you know, that type of order uh, happening in, in the system. You can go back to uh, your Monte Carlo calculations and you can look at uh, the correlation functions in the system. So this, is, uh, uh, this correlation function tells me if I'm, a spin, if I'm a spin up and sitting at this location, what should I expect? for spin of my neighbors? What should I expect for the spin of the farther neighbors? What should I expect the spin of the, spin of, of the particle at the corner of the uh, room to be, right? So this uh, is a correlation over a distance. And you can see the perfect uh, uh, zigzag form, which points to this anti-alignment over a very long distance. So what I described as, as anti-ferromagnetic phases is clearly seen here through 
the numerical simulations. Here I'm going around a triangle. You might wonder why, why this is a flat line. It's because I go on a triangle and I come back on a diagonal. And if you come back on a, on a diagonal uh, on your lattice, all of those are going to be aligned with each other because they are next nearest neighbors. So you can perfectly capture that. You can change uh, parameters in your system. You can see that things become very strong when you increase this interaction. And that's the thing with, uh, with the correlation that I talked about. Uh, the more interaction you have in your system between your particles, the uh, more pronounced your, your correlations are going to be. And every time you have a, a periodic function like this, you can take the Fourier transform of it, and you know that you will have a very sharp peak in the, in the, in the Fourier space, in the K space. And that's what happens. If I take the Fourier transform of them, I have a very sharp peak at, at a particular uh, wave, wave vector, wave number. Dr. Katana, this is a minor aside, but I'm, I'm wondering why you do come back on that diagonal in the, in the, in the plots. I mean, uh, it's kind of interesting. I mean, yeah, is it's, there a way that you need to have a closed curve in your uh, you don't You don't have to. This is, this is like going through the um, uh, uh, limits of your, your cluster, your lattice, and then coming back to kind of cover cover all directions. You want to represent all of the numerical calculation you did. That's so you right. You go out in one axis and the right. other and right. come back. Right, right, right. And then by, by comparing these to each other, you can kind of see how these correlations uh, uh, are affected over, over distance. Right, so they are not really affected much in this case. So this was all for the two-dimensional system. Uh, and it turns out that every time, if this diverges, if this goes to infinity, that means I have a perfect long-range uh, antiferromagnetic order, magnetic order in my system. But for two dimensions, this happens at, at zero temperature, absolute zero temperature. If you want something to happen at, at finite temperature, you have to go to a three-dimensional version of the same thing. And here I'm showing the same quantity, but I'm showing it as a function of uh, density. So this is that symmetric half-filling uh, scenario, and in this case, if you go to slightly lower temperatures, this point actually diverges. This point goes to infinity, and you can see that that may be happening for uh, cases where I've removed some of my particles from the system, reducing the density or increasing the density, but it doesn't happen for, for very low densities. So as you go away from the symmetric point, this magnetic order uh, kind of dies off. So it allows maybe for other types of order to, or phases to set in to your system, including uh, conducting uh, phases and superconducting phases. So um, I can also study uh, correlations between pairs, uh, but let me skip this. This is uh, not crucial. But at the end, um, I think uh, I've shown you that you know, we start with, with materials. We try to understand their properties. We end up uh, simplifying a lot, coming up with models, with quantum lattice models. And then we realize that we can't even, even solve them. Like when, when it comes to uh, pairing, so I skipped this, but, but you realize when you go away from um, the symmetric point, you can see that some of my, my points are, are missing here at lower temperatures. And that's for a good reason, because my numerical methods, none of the numerical methods has uh, access to exact properties as I go away from this symmetric point. So there's a large section of, of the parameter space that remains unexplored because we just can't do anything with our uh, numerical methods. So once we realize that we can't solve this exactly everywhere, uh, then we have to resort to some other methods. That's why in the past uh, you know, 10 years or so, people in the atomic, molecular, and optical physics have uh, uh, noticed uh, our failures and tried to realize the same theoretical models using uh, lasers to create uh, something that looks like a lattice and atoms that are going to move around tunnel, quantum tunnel uh, around and interact with each other and play the role of electrons. And the hope is that you can close the circle, you can go back and understanding, having understood all the properties of your theoretical model, you can go back and de design materials that have specific properties that you're interested in. So let me tell you a little bit about how this, uh, these, these systems are, are put together, these uh, 
lattices with lasers and optical lattices. Well, these are people who know very well uh, how to how atoms interact with light, interact with laser, and so they can uh, create a gas of uh, of of uh, certain uh, atom and and confine it in in some in some very small region in space, and they do that with light and magnetic fields. Uh, oftentimes, they have to come up with uh, some um, uh, harmonic potentials uh, that become very large at the edges as a way to confine their, their system in a, in a small region. So this is some kind of a, uh, a potential barrier that doesn't allow the particles to just escape from, from that gas that, that was created. And these are very expensive, you know, multi-million dollar uh, uh, um, labs that, that now many, many universities have and can explore these, these properties. So now you have this, this hot gas. Uh, before you can do any physics with them, you have to cool them down. And there are many ways of, of, of cooling. This is a very simple um, picture of so-called laser cooling. So you guide your particles through some channel using magnetic field. And you essentially hit them uh, head on with, with a laser. And by stopping them, by reducing the kinetic energy, you're, you're essentially reducing the temperature in, in your system. Uh, this was done by our former energy secretary, uh, which uh, got him a Nobel Prize uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, there are other types of cooling. Uh, this is something that you uh, encounter every day with your uh, coffee cup. It's evaporative cooling, so they lower this confining potential, and some of the hot particles on the edges are going to escape and essentially lower the temperature of, of your system. Now that you have a rather cool system of these atoms, you can try to impose uh, something that looks like the, the lattice structure that I had in my model. So these lattices are created using um, counter-propagating laser beams. And what happens when you, when you do that is that you create a standing bay um, and you can trap your particles uh, either on the minima or the maxima of, of, of these standing bays. So you have a periodic structure that can be very, very long and can mimic what happened you know, in, my, in my lattice of, of, of atoms. So if you shine uh, these counter-propagating lasers from, from two different sides, uh, they will be confined in, in, in the other third dimension. So you end up with this uh, cigar-shaped uh, uh, Fermi or gases, right? These are just gases of atoms. Uh, if you do that from all six sides, you end up with something that looks like a cubic lattice, right? So now you have, you can probably tune uh, the concentration of your atoms so that you have, on average, you know, one atom per uh, one, of these, one of these spheres so that you perfectly capture that, you know, Fermi-Howard model for, for example, a cubic lattice. And so you can imagine, because these are kind of close to each other, you can have a quantum tunneling between these sites. And you can add inter interaction through a magnetic field, and you can control it very well in these experiments. So they have all the ingredients to uh, essentially simulate this theoretical model that I had that I couldn't, couldn't solve. Dr. Katam, I think you said that at the beginning when you were talking about the optical lattices with lasers. And so I was, I was familiar with this work kind of in general, mm -hmm. but to, to see, it was it really grown out of wanting to have physical systems modeling these things that got too computationally difficult to model? I mean, is that the main driver for these building these optical lattices? I think part of it was that there was a lot of interest in the solutions of the fermi Hubbard model and the implications that would have for uh, understanding high temperature superconductivity. Okay. So it was a very, uh, I would say, uh, it, it is still a very high profile problem in, in condensed matter physics that has been you know, driving us for the for, you know, last 40 years. Um, and so this was a very important unsolved problem that they thought they could, they could approach and, and try to simulate. But I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of the, you know, the exact history of, of how it came about. So if you have you know, this type of systems, you can, you can uh, um, and, and you know that they are, they are at probably low temperatures, you can study uh, you know, their magnetic properties. So this is uh, 
uh, work done on this exact uh, three-dimensional uh, Fermi Hubbard model, and then you could uh, shine light, and that light coupled differently to the different spin species of, of these atoms. And from the interference pattern, you could um, essentially uh, capture the structure factor that was going to diverge when, when you have an order. So you can directly access uh, the structure factor of uh, magnetic structure factor of your system, and that would give us you know, these uh, circles. Uh, these are the experimental data when you vary the interaction between your particles. And so uh, this is a very small, isolated quantum mechanical system. There is no heat reservoir. There's no way for me to stick a thermometer and tell them you know, uh, what temperature the system is operating on. The only way to realize what the temperature is is to go back to numerics and uh, solve this model with the same uh, parameters as, as, the, as the experiment. And in the numerics, we do have a reservoir. We do, have, we do treat our uh, configurations in, in, a, in, in uh, using a Boltzmann distribution. So we have temperature, and we can do the simulations for uh, uh, varying temperatures and fit that to the, to the experimental data. And so now you can see that the only, like, the only parameter here is temperature. And you can kind of see that the experimental data matches 0.5. So from this comparison, uh, you could you know, benchmark what is happening uh, in the experiment and kind of uh, uh, understand what temperature they are operating on. So this was kind of early work. Uh, these are things that we can actually simulate. Uh, now things have, have changed. Uh, they uh, routinely do these experiments in two-dimensional you know, square lattices like this. And what has changed uh, recently, in recent uh, years, is that in 2D, they can use this electron gas microscope, which essentially takes uh, snapshots of, of the picture at different times. And so by taking many, many, many of those images and analyzing them, uh, you can study, you can find out what the correlations are in your system. You essentially just count your atoms, right? So this is an actual picture, and this is the same picture where, where one of the spin species has been removed, and you can kind of see that perfect checkerboard pattern. This is after some analysis. You come up with this, uh, you know, a clean picture, and you can kind of see this checkerboard pattern that spin-ups are only on every other atomic site. So this is the perfect, you know, antiferromagnetic order in, in two dimension. And those are atomic sites individually. You were talking about them being little reservoirs, but you can right. go down to their you can go to the atoms. single atom. So I yeah. haven't read this nature right. article, but it looks fascinating. Right. <laughs> it is fascinating. The spin yeah. state of individual atoms right. Right. being imaged here. That's right. Okay. Yeah. That's right. Of course you destroy your system when you take the image. Uh, so you have to repeat the whole experiment many, many times with the same parameters to be able to you know gain some some insight. So this is done again because uh, what I said earlier about, about uh, superconductors and their kind of you know, phases that people see in the experiment. So this is the type of uh, you know, uh, phases that people in the, in, see in the experiment. This is this uh, symmetric half-field uh, limit here. And as I go in my x-axis, I'm removing particles from, from the system. So doping means uh, introducing holes to the system, removing particles. And so here, I expect this antiferromagnetic phase. I expect it to survive a little bit when I dope. But then if I dope it uh, further, and if I go to much lower temperatures, I may end up with this superconducting phase. This is actually what is seen in the experiments with cuprates. But we think that this model has the ingredients uh, to capture this phase. But the unfortunate thing is that so far in these experiments, they can only go down to these type of temperatures. So they can, they can be here, they can even come to this region where it's difficult for us to do uh, calculations, but they are not yet uh, close to uh, you know, the holy grail of, of uh, all of this for, uh, for materials and for, for theoretical models, which would be the superconducting phase. But uh, nevertheless, you can... Uh, do these type of experiments and, and get a lot of correlations uh, calculated. And so these are just some examples of theory experiment comparisons. Uh, this is a spin correlation. This is something that I showed you earlier, but only between neighboring sites. And what is changing here is essentially the density is increasing. So when I have 
no particles, there is no correlations. And as I introduce particles in my system, get closer and closer to that, to that half field symmetric region where I have one uh, atom per site, these correlations become more and more negative. The negativity is because these are anti-aligned, so there's a negative sign, but they become larger in magnitude. So that makes sense. You can look at the same thing as a function of temperature. As you lower the temperature, these correlations grow stronger. So these are all like supportive of, of the same picture I showed you earlier. Um, you can study some more complicated correlation functions, but let me skip that to get to uh, another uh, system that was studied where you add an effective magnetic field. Now you can apply that magnetic field effectively by removing some of the particles of a, of a certain species from your system. So you can say, I want to have more spin-ups than spin-downs. That's an effective magnetic field in the uh, uh, up direction, in the plus Z direction. And so this is an experiment where uh, you can look at the spin-down pictures. You can look at spin-ups, which are, which are much more. And you can look at the total. So this one is the polarization that is essentially just the difference between the number of different species of, of these atoms. And it increases as I, as I um, uh, go away from the center of my cloud. So this is radius here uh, uh, refers to radius of the cloud of, of, of atoms that I have on a lattice uh, in a very small region of space. So here they are mostly uh, um, constant. But as I go away to the edges of my, of my, my system, they, uh, I have less and less particles. And eventually, I have nothing. So this is kind of a uh, 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 representative of this confining potential that I have. But what is interesting here is that uh, we can, again, look at the, uh, these checkerboard patterns for the antiferromagnetic uh, correlation uh, as we vary the polarization, as we in increase the strength of this magnetic field. And when you have very small magnetic field, you have this perfect checkerboard patterns. And as you increase uh, the magnetic field, something very interesting happens that here, uh, my next nearest neighbors are no longer red, right? They turn, they turn blue, which shows me that this antiferromagnetic uh, phase is kind of fading away, at least in the z direction. So um, in this case, you have a magnetic field along z, but your spins can form that antiferromagnetic ordering in some other direction, they can go to the xy plane and do their antiferromagnetic business, right? And be kind of ferromagnetic to make the magnetic field happy along z. So this is a, a, a new phase of matter uh, that was uh, studied here uh, that is called the canted antiferromagnetic order. So they are kind of tilted towards the xy plane as they do the antiferromagnetic order. Uh, very recently, they um, uh, have tried to you know, explore some other regions of this phase diagram. Um, in this study, they uh, sat at this particular doping here, and they came down um, in temperature and studied a conducting property of, of their system of atoms. And what they realized is that this uh, resistivity, which is 1 over the conductivity, uh, goes uh, very linearly as a function of temperature. And that's very interesting because for a long time, people uh, have been seeing something like that in the, uh, in the experiments with real materials, and they call it strange metal behavior. Because for a regular metal, you expect, it turns out that you should expect uh, a resistivity that goes like a uh, T squared, that goes like a parabolic function with temperature, not a linear function. That's why they called it strange metal. And very interestingly, in this uh, study, in this experimental uh, in a simulation of, of, of this model, uh, they could see like an almost perfect uh, linear behavior of this resistivity with temperature. So they're kind of attacking you know, this phase diagram from different, different sides and like verifying uh, that this very simplistic model, again, can describe many of the uh, features that we see here for the actual material in the experiments in the lab. And so it's very exciting to uh, see them work their way uh, at, 
to lower temperatures and, and eventually probably get to the superconducting phase. Um, there is questions about how to detect that superconducting phase, what are, what are ways that we can do that, or how we can actually get to those temperatures. So that's the main difficulty with these experiments. It's very nice. Everything is very well controlled. Uh, they can prepare the systems and control the systems uh, very well, but the problem is that uh, they cannot really cool it to uh, temperatures that are going to be relevant to this very uh, sought-after phase. Another study, this is my uh, last slide, uh, is about uh, conductivity, but not conductivity in terms of charge, but in terms of spin, right? So you can completely freeze your your charge, you can have a uniform charge everywhere, one atom per site, but the spin can, can move around, the spin can propagate. So if I have a disturbance in spin of my particles, if I gather all the spin ups in one side and all the spin downs in one side and let them go, they're going to come back together, they're going to equilibrate in a fashion that, that you know, uh, ends up with, with you know, uh, uh, you know, these scenarios where, where, where there is no uh, uh, region where, uh, you know, you have, you have some separation of spin. So, uh, so through that process, they can, they can study uh, conduction of, of spin. And this is what happened in this experiment here. They uh, apply some effective magnetic field by tilting, tilting their, their lattice, um, but doing a tilt so that for one uh, species of spin, uh, you have a lower potential in one side, and for the other one, you have a lower potential on the other side, and then let it, letting it go for, for this to, to equilibrate. So from that dynamic, you can uh, extract uh, things like spin conductivity, and you can study it as a function of uh, you know, 1 over your interaction strength, or T over U, and you know, get these, get these uh, experimental points. So there is... Uh, you, clearly two different regions for this, uh, for this um, model that are very clear at, at high and, and low uh, interaction strength. That was very interesting. And this is a, a theoretical line that represents the lower limit uh, for, this, for this quantity. This is a very difficult quantity to calculate uh, using numerics. That's why you can only approximate and get some lower limits. So these are like they're getting to the, uh, uh, you know, uh, boundary of science and, and trying to push them uh, to lower temperatures, to, to parameter regions that are inaccessible, that have been inaccessible to us numerically for a long time. So we are getting there, but we're not quite there. So uh, with that, I want to just I put up this summary slide, and, and thank you for your attention. Yeah, yeah, sure, about, sure. Um, I, I think it was called, or titled, Trapping Atoms. So. Yeah. This one. Yeah, yeah, so this, uh, actually this, this one looks like a harmonic potential. So you know from, yeah, just a harmonic oscillator, right? So you have a, a, a 1 over 2k x squared, which is, which is harmonic. And this is essentially the same thing. You have some bound states, right, yeah. inside inside your um, your potential inside. So, so this is the same thing. They're going to be. Um, you have a lot of these particles, so you uh, go to very high energies, right? So if you remember, I think I have a marker here. We just talked about it in quantum mechanics class. So that's why. I right, right. So like in quantum mechanics class, you normally just calculate the first. Uh, ground, like the yeah. lowest energy state, and then you calculate the you know, first excited state, and so on, right? So this, this is the same picture. Now, if I add particles to my, um, to my potential, you're going to have like two fermions here, because one is spin up, one is spin down, right? And you can't put more on, on this energy level, right? This is some energy level, this is some energy level. And then you can calculate <laughs> higher energy levels. They get closer, right? Now, it's the same thing. But I have many, many particles, so I uh, fill up, you know, I fill up these uh, energy levels with two particles and I keep going up in energy to, to where it becomes, you know, maybe very continuous uh, spectrum. Huh. So when I talk about cooling uh, or evaporative cooling, uh, that's, 
that's the same thing, like letting go, if I lower this potential, I, I let go of uh, those fermions that are occupying very high energies and contributing to, to uh, a lot of you know, heat in my system. Right. This is the same thing. What distribution? Yeah, but what kind of prior distributions were you using? For um, so this is discrete time, uh, the things that I use. Um, and you, well, your space is already discrete, uh, right? It's, 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 you're working on a grid. Uh, and you also discretize your, um, you, you end up with another dimension that you have to consider. And that's a quantum dimension. And that's the time, I believe, that you're talking about. It, it turns out to be an imaginary time, these uh, Monte Carlo simulations, because the extra time uh, is, is essentially inverse temperature. And you can treat in quantum mechanics, sometimes you can think of inverse temperature as uh, imaginary time, because they, you know, beta and it uh, show up in the exponent of, of some of your exponentials in quantum mechanics in, in, a, in a similar fashion. So that extra dimension of inverse temperature, you discretize that, and you end up with essentially an Ising type um, set of configurations for, for spins, which you call auxiliary spins, because they are not real spins. They live in this d plus 1 dimension. And the prior configuration, if I understand that correctly, you may mean initial configuration. And that's completely random. So in these systems, you, in these simulations, you, you come up with some random uh, configuration for your auxiliary spins, and you just treat them like Ising spins and go from there. in my head is I loved your description of the pairs moving along, mm -hmm. you know, for superconductivity. It was um, just kind of a beautiful diagram, I think, co you know, done in, in PowerPoint yeah. or in the keynote. It was very impressive. Took quite a, um, quite a few I'm going to go a little off the, yes. the board and and just, we were having a, a dinner conversation with a, with a speaker previously about superconductivity. Um, we were talking about energy as well and battery, you know, future things. Um, you're, you know, you're in this field studying it and, and modeling it. What, what are your thoughts in terms of innovative materials and, and you know, how, how, how possible is it that this will, will be transformative technologies? And going off, off mm -hmm. of the physics, but off of what, what could happen with with um, easier to work with superconductors. Right, so, um, well, I should mention that uh, we already have applications of, of superconductors, high temperature superconductors. Uh, so they've already entered our lives. If you um, uh, have seen uh, MRI machine, ma magnetic uh, resonant imaging uh, machines in hospitals, they use uh, superconducting magnets to create large magnetic fields to do the imaging. Um, or you might have uh, seen the uh, high-speed train in, in Japan that uses magnetic levitation. In order to create those large magnets to cause levitation of a train, you need uh, superconducting magnets, and it's actually used in that, in that, in that device. So uh, there are some applications uh, already, but the, the challenge is that you have, to have, uh, you have to be able to cool them down to very low temperatures still. I mean, we call them high-temperature superconductors, but for our standards, it's, it's very low temperature still. So uh, I think we might be able to, uh, you know, use this model or similar models to, to describe, to understand, as Diana said, what individual particles do uh, in the systems, in the superconductor, right? But then from the theory aspect to application, there may be uh, also a long way to go because then you have to go and you have to uh, uh, be able to design 
uh, materials uh, that that kind of mimic your model in the in the region where, where you have a high like a superconducting phase at very high temperatures, right? So you may be able to come up with a geometry for your lab for your atomic uh, structure, or you can come up with some some model parameters, interactions, or whatever that give you very high temperature superconductor, right? Then you have to be able to go and and design that in the lab, in an actual lab, with an actual material. And so that's going to be another challenge, uh, uh, even after you understand everything about, about the mechanism, theoretically. So May I follow up, Dr. Katami? The way you're describing is you really do think that there would be a breakthrough in the modeling showing some interesting behavior that material scientists need to try to make that material. You're, you're really hopeful of investigating that parameter space more fully with these models or these lab experiments mm -hmm. might point out interesting physics that that's will right. be followed up with real material. That's right, yeah. So that's, that's the uh, line of thought and that's the hope uh, in the community that, that, that we could one day, one day hopefully do that. Could you describe what you were using electron gas microscopy for? Um, I, I might have missed it, but like what versus other like a scanning electron microscope or atomic force microscope? Is there an advantage to using a gas microscope? Um, um, so I'm a theorist, if you may have noticed. So I have like little information about you know the specifics of how it works and how it compares to other imaging techniques. But the ones that you mentioned are, are uh, done on, on solids, on, on real materials, right? And so you just go in there and, and through some um, current, you know, you can, you can tell, you know, what is where. Uh, and you're not really destroying your system, right? Um, whereas here, it's just uh, light, essentially, that you shine on your, your atoms. And, and you literally, like, look at their, their, their shadow. Uh, oh. Right, and through that process, uh, you you essentially destroy your your system. Um, okay. So if you want to have multiple images, you have to create the same system from scratch, again, and and look at it. So um, as far as I understand, this is just shining light. This is done by 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 light simply. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so, um, well, where, where I grew up in Iran, uh, there wasn't many opportunities to do, uh, uh, you know, cutting-edge experimental uh, science uh, or experimental physics because those labs, uh, you know, uh, are expensive. So, um, so, you know, I thought that maybe with computers, you know, you can, you can do a lot of, a lot of things with, theoretically or, or in computers. And so um, I was generally interested in, in programming, uh, in, in computers, in, in these type of modelings. Um, and it kind of started in my, in my master's. Uh, you know, I started on a project uh, that was on carbon nanotubes, uh, kind of studying the transport properties when you have you know, leads and then you, know, uh, you connect your leads and, and you try to model that and, and, and come up with a theory for, for the transportation of electrons. Um, and it kind of, you know, I, I went from there. Like when I came here uh, in the US, um, you know, I was, uh, I joined a group which was uh, uh, doing cutting edge in numerical algorithm development and, and, and programming and, and simulation of, 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 of these models uh, in the University of Cincinnati and that's, uh, you know, I joined and I just just went from there and at some point uh, you know you do all these calculations you do all these numeric numerics um, and then you know there comes along uh, the uh, the optical lattice uh, experiments in the community that that become interested in your model uh, become interested in in you know uh, doing similar situa uh, simulations but but with, with cold atoms and optical lattices and uh, all of the calculations that you've done uh, and you know, studies that you've done kind of become uh, interesting to them because they want to do, they want to characterize their system, they want to understand what the temperatures they're, uh, they're operating at, they want to understand if the correlation functions they calculate make sense, you know, what they point to. And so uh, uh, 
you know, after all of those years and all of those, uh, you know, calculations, uh, it's, it's very, um, uh, you know, humbling to see that, that you know, this is, this is actually useful to some, to some you know, real life experiments and, and hopefully for, for future, for, you know, experiments with real materials. So um, I just, you know, keep getting motivated more and more. The more you do, the more uh, uh, interested you become, the more motivated you become. Uh, and just, you know, I just kept it going. Any more questions for Dr. Well, maybe you can come up after and ask your questions in a more private setting. But all right, thank you. Thank you.